two more incidents that I'd just like to briefly mention today. And these are the two most uh, complicated and bizarre, so I don't want to go into too much detail. But in 1934, the Righteous Judges panel, which you see missing here, this photo was taken on the day that it was stolen, disappeared. In the middle of the night, um, one or more thieves stole this panel. This panel is about, it's probably about this tall and about this wide. Um, and it depicts uh, what are known as the Righteous Judges in procession to go um, pay homage to Mystic Lamb. It also contains portraits, it's very blurry here, you can't see it, but this is meant to be a portrait of Jan Van Eyck, and this is meant to be a portrait of his brother Hubert, and Philip the Good can also be seen as portraits in, in this work. It was stolen, and the initial investigation smacked of either ineptitude or conspiracy or both. First of all, the crime scene was polluted by the agitated citizens of Ghent who wanted to take a look at the theft and arrived long before the police did. The police had been delayed because they were investigating the theft of cheese from a shop across the square. <laughs> Even stranger, they left the crime scene early to go back and chase after the cheese thief, which they thought was far more sinister. Um, pinned to the frame from which this panel was written, um, was a sign saying, taken from Germany by the Treaty of Versailles. So they thought at first that this was a German nationalist um, incident. It turned out to be a red herring. But what was stolen was this panel and the back to it, which was the Grisaille of John the Baptist that you saw earlier. And those panels had been split vertically. They were one piece of oak, but they'd been split vertically so you could display both sides from the front at the Kaiser Friedrich Museum in Berlin. This, of course, would never be done today. It's incredibly dangerous for the work of art, but it had been done, so they essentially stole two panels. However, the police report says that they only stole one. This is another example of the ineptitude. Police got absolutely nowhere in their inquiries, and then several months after the theft, this fellow, whose name is very difficult to pronounce, but my best attempt is Arsene Coudetier, a plump middle-aged stockbroker from a suburb of Ghent was at a political rally for a Catholic political organization and collapsed of a heart attack. He was taken to the home of his brother-in-law. He called for his lawyer, a guy called George DeVos, and he whispered in his ear, I'm the last person on earth who knows where the stolen judge's camp is. And then with perfect cinematic timing, he died <laughs> before he could tell anything else. Strangely, George DeVos was a local magistrate, did not go to the police, but he and four other local magistrates who were essentially lawyers who investigated in conjunction with the police decided they were not going to involve the police at all, but they investigated for one full month before they even told the police about the confession. They didn't get very far, but it smacked many people of conspiracy, and there's a very complicated uh, series of plots that followed because there were 13 ransom notes ostensibly <laughs> sent by Arsene Pudetier to the Bishop of Ghent. Um, very strange, almost laugh out loud funny ransom notes where the ransomer seems to be um, objecting to the fact that the bishop doesn't want to pay a ransom and if he went to all the trouble of stealing this all the, this account from the altar piece, the least the bishop could do is pay the ransom for it. It seemed, uh, and to fast forward a bit and um, to give you some reason to read the book, so I have a good way of saying, it seemed that Arsene Pudetier was the mastermind behind a multifaceted plot. Um, there were all sorts of conspiracy theories about why he would have stolen the altar piece when he was in fact a very rich man. The uh, ransom man was for one million Belgian francs, but the police found that in his private bank account he had three million Belgian francs. So there doesn't seem to have been a financial motivation. My favorite conspiracy theory is this. You may know that Hitler and the Nazi elite were uh, genuine believers in the occult and mysticism. Uh, and the concept of the Indiana Jones films comes from real history. There was a Nazi um, occult investigation research group called the Achmenerva that sponsored uh, essentially scholarly research trips looking for the Holy Grail and the Ark of the Covenant. Um, there, was, there was a trip sent to Tibet to look for the Yeti, the abominable snowman, to capture for military purposes. Um, so it is not odd to think that Hitler would think that there's some sort of uh, mystical or occult significance to the Ghent altar piece. Uh, and one of the theories posits that the Ghent altar piece contains a coded treasure map to what's called the Arma Christi, or the implements used in Christ's passion. And that Hitler believed that possessing the 
these uh, spiritual relics would give him supernatural powers. And knowing what we do about Hitler and, and the Nazi elite, this is not uh, a bizarre thought um, that they wouldn't believe this. Um, and the thought is that this code and treasure map had a key component to it hidden in the Righteous Judges panel, and that the panel was stolen to prevent Hitler from getting the completed map. Sounds pretty wacky to me, but there you go. Um, there are other theories, but um, none of them have been agreed upon. One seems to implicate, implicate the um, bishopric itself, and this is one that, that I go into in some detail in the book. Um, but there's a strange coda to this story that I'll get to in just a moment. Um, the next set of uh, thefts began in the Second World War, but I should just finish by saying that officially, uh, the Gant altar piece is 11 twelfths intact, and officially, when you go to visit it, you see 11 paintings by uh, Jan van Eyck and one uh, which is a replacement copy of the Righteous Judgment Panel, which is officially still missing. As recently as 2008, there was an anonymous tip sent to the Ghent police that the Righteous Judges panel was buried next to a skeleton under the floorboards of a house in Ghent, and the police take this very seriously, and they investigated ripped up the floorboards and didn't find anything. And it may be no surprise that they didn't find anything, because a large number of people believe that the Ghent altarpiece is actually completely intact. And I'll get to that in just a moment. The next series of adventures. I don't want to go into, into detail because this is the longest of the stories, the most dramatic. I should say this gets you desperate to read the book, right? <laughs> um, but suffice to say that the Gentile piece was among the most sought objects by both Hitler and Hermann Goering, the second in command of the Nazis. Um, Goering had stolen about 12,000 works of art for himself using the Nazi art theft unit, which is called the ERR, as his sort of personal um, uh, shopping gallery. And he flew on 12 different occasions to Paris to the Jeudepont Museum, which is where the ERR gathered all of the art that they stole from Nazi occupied Europe. And these 12 visits had no strategic significance. It was simply to choose art for his private collection. And he actually competed with Hitler, racing to be the first to steal works of art that Hitler either wanted for himself or wanted for a super museum that he planned in Linz, Austria, which was meant to be a citywide museum containing every important artwork in the world um, that would have been constructed um, after the war had the Nazis been successful. The Ghent altar piece was sent by um, the city of Ghent to Chateau de Pau in the south of France for safekeeping, from which it was stolen by the agents of Goering. Uh, in 1942. It was eventually uh, restored at Castle Neuschwanstein by Nazi art restorers and sent to a secret underground salt mine that had been converted to a high-tech art storage facility in Althausen in the mountains near Salzburg in Austria. And this was one of hundreds of secret art storage facilities in salt mines, uh, abandoned monasteries and castles that was prepared by the Nazis in the process of, of their campaigns. These were places to store works of art, to store gold, to store um, uh, uh, Reichsmarks, the, the Nazi currency, to store paraphernalia, even the skeletons and coffins of famous Germanic warlords were stored in some of these mines. And it was absolutely staggering the extent it was discovered by the Allies at the end of the war. But it wasn't until 1943 the Allies even became aware of Hitler's planned super museum. And it's, it's not given away the punchline to tell you that the Gant Walter piece, along with Mona Lisa and Leonardo's Lady with a Hermit, and works by Vermeer and Titian and Rembrandt and Van Dyke, um, Michelangelo, were all saved in the end. But it was a very narrow escape because the SS governor in charge of the Althausi region, against Hitler's direct orders, was determined to blow up every one of the artworks in his possession if he couldn't defend them against the Allies. And he barely nearly did so. He actually got so far as to plant bombs inside the salt mine in the art storage rooms. Um, and through the heroism of Austrian miners working through the resistance, and a very funny story that is, uh, would make a great film, uh, a group of Austrian double agent commandos who were parachuted in to try to use guerrilla tactics to delay the destruction of the mine. And thanks to the detective work of two Allied monuments and fine arts officers, um, one this guy here, Robert Posey, and the other very famous person, Lincoln.